Art Day and to Simonstown. Um, I'm just going to share my screen for a presentation that I've prepared. Okay. Can you all see the screen? Yes, we can. Thanks. Okay. Can you see the presentation or do you see the notes on the side too? So the presentation only invasive species unit. Okay, great. Okay, the city of Cape Town has a green jobs unit, or otherwise known as the invasive species unit. Our aim is to improve the livelihoods of the citizens of Cape Town by creating jobs while simultaneously improving the natural environment within the city of Cape Town. Mainly we mainly do invasive species control and to support our invasive species control, we have the green jobs component who assists in the form of restoration, plant propagation and erosion, erosion control. You can just see some of the activities that the team uh, do in field, clearing early detection species such as the pampas grass, the top right are the invasive animals that our department controls. They've got the guttural toad, the Indian house crow, and the rather cute but highly invasive mallard duck. I think it's important just to give context to this meeting uh, to explain what the difference is between an invasive species and an alien species. As you are aware, there are many, many alien species within our country that are already established but don't show any invasive tendencies. An invasive tendency would be a tendency to outcompete our natural or endemic indigenous vegetation or fauna. Invasive species is a species that has a tendency to spread, which is believed to cause damage to the environment, human economy and or human health. That lovely picture that you see is the city of Cape Town and clearly with slap bang in the middle of our city, we have a national park, the Table Mountain National Park. Cape Town is located in a biodiversity hotspot. The city surrounds itself with important biodiversity sites. Not only do we have Table Mountain National Park, we also have 27 City of Cape Town Nature Reserve. Nature Reserve spread throughout the metro. The Western Cape is remarkably biodiverse and a Cape floristic region, a world heritage site containing the, the unique Feinbos biome is famed for having one of its highest concentration of plant species per unit area globally. Two thirds of the region's 9,000 plant species are found nowhere else on earth. And no less than 2,000 of these species are threatened with extinction by invasive species. This is a lovely infographic that was put together by the Nature Conservancy and the city of Cape Town. It was conducted on the Atlantis Aquifer. It's a, one of the first scientific studies that looked at how much water are we actually losing to invasive species. So what they did was they in, installed a scientific measurement into the xylem vessels of the tree to, con, to measure the, the heat being transferred from the the tree canopy to the roots and then they set up an automatic weather station with remote sensing to measure the evapotranspiration rate from the plant. And what they found was an acacia salingana, which is a Port Jackson willow, on the Atlantis aquifer can grow up to seven meters tall and use more than 30 liters of water per day. The more water available, the denser the acacia tree stands become, which means the more water the trees ultimately use. The study concluded that an invasive Port Jackson tree uses up to 8,000 cubic meters of water per hectare per year in high density stands with access to groundwater. Simply by removing invasive plants and restoring indigenous feinbos, it could result in the reclamation of between 830,000 liters of water per hectare, between 830, between, sorry, between 830,000 and 2 million liters of water 
per hectare. At the bottom, you can just sort of see the, the bang for your buck in terms of the traditional approach where we reuse water, the desalination plants that we looked in, groundwater exploration, and obviously infrastructure like dams and so on and so forth. And then the, the action of removing invasive species through our catchments. What you're seeing here is a early detection and rapid response graph. This is one of our strategies in how we manage invasive species. The first line of, the, of defense would obviously be to prevent the, the plant or animal from arriving on our shores. The next step, that's obviously when it's first introduced and the numbers are very low. The plant population will grow throughout time and as time increases, so does your infestation and your cost to control. It's a whole lot more expensive to restore an area as opposed to just preventing the infestation in the first place. So as I said, when it comes to managing invasive species, prevention is the first line of defense. Fortunately, we do have legislation that is in place to try and prevent that and our green scorpion units at the national, I mean, at the international airports where they've got these scanners in place and they are supposed to scan each person's luggage and all our importing, all our products that we get imported. That isn't being done too effectively as, as of now. Um, hopefully in the future that will be improved. That sits with national government. And this is just our early detection and rapid response program that, that we have. We have a spotter network, which I'll talk about a little bit further. This is one of our early detection and rapid response plants. It's called the Pampas grass. It comes from Argentina. As you can see, it forms dense stands in wetlands, and it is still listed as an early detection species on our list, which means we believe we have the ability to nip it in the bud, so to say, um, and prevent further costs further down the line. So we have these Cape Town weed alert pamphlets, which I'll happily share to the users or to, to any member of the public about the plants that we are, that we have as on our early detection and rapid response list. A few more. So at the moment, we have 22 species that are on our list, plant species. As you know, this is a living list. Um, there's the pampas grass, your Montpelier broom, your bluebell creeper, your devil's beard, which we have quite a bit in, Bavians, uh, a common garden escapee, and then your Spanish broom. So one of the methods that we control invasive species is by the use of biocontrol. That would be through insects, diseases, fungi, from the country of origin. Uh, a risk assessment is conducted to determine if the, the, the fungi or the insect is host specific and only will eat the plant or, or, uh, insect or um, animal at hand. Um, thorough tests are done before we can introduce any biocontrol agent. Uh, they are released and then monitored thereafter. We have a biocontrol insect mass rearing facility where we focus on megamillus mostly, which is a, the insect for water hyacinth. And these are our colleagues from Bethesda Health Bay, where we have a partnership with them, and they provide us with the counts and assisting rearing their insects. This is just a quick before and after of parrot's feather, uh, where biocontrol agents were released. And a couple months later, they're taking effect. Um, this is a slow process. It's it, it as many variables because we rely on the weather and so on and so forth. So it re requires constant introductions of um, biocontrol agents in order to establish a, a population for it to be effective. And then the traditional invasive plant control the methods that we use, which would be manual, chemical, mechanical, and biological. That biological goals that you see is a fungus on Port Jackson, and the little wasp that you see uh, in your right-hand corner is 
also a biological control agent that targets long-leafed wattles. Fire is also a mechanism, although we would certainly not use that in the Bavian's cliff. Hand pulling, obviously it's ideal for young plants in soft soil and in highly sensitive areas. It's important that uh, the team obviously get the roots, otherwise you're wasting your time and effort. Tree popper is another tool that's used by the team, mechanical, chainsaws, brush cutters to target larger species. And then the chemical control, which would be foliar application. This is something that we're not using in Bavians, given the proximity to the river. And that's just a, a few pictures on not to, to apply the chemical. There's clearly not any PPE being worn and the spray is at face height. Another method would be herbicide. After cut stamp, filling or ring barking, this is a method that the team is using. Without herbicide, unfortunately, many species coppice and it becomes oh, ineffective and a whole lot more costly to control later on down the line. Just a few um, images of what a good cut is on the left. The team obviously needs to cut low um, in order to cut low and apply and get an even cut in order for the herbicide to penetrate the stem. Uh, poor cuts, as you can see on the right, result in the plant coppicing because it doesn't absorb enough herbicide. Now, why are we doing this? I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with the National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act. These regulations came into effect in 2014. So invasive species are controlled by NEMA, member, Alien Invasive Species Regulations, which were gazetted in August 2014 and became law on the 1st of October 2014. Currently, we have 559 invaders divided into four categories. The Alien Invasive Species Regulation lists, lists four different categories of invasive species that must be managed, controlled, or eradicated from areas where they may cause harm to the environment or that are prohibited to be brought into South Africa. Of that list, 383 are plants, 41 are mammals, 24 birds, 35 reptiles, seven amphibian species, of which we have one in the city of Cape Town, the guttural toad, and freshwater fish, which, also, which we also have quite a lot in the Western Cape in our catchments, where we also have a high level of endemism for freshwater fish. Terrestrial invertebrates, freshwater invertebrates, marine invertebrates, you've got the green crab in Heart Bay Harbor, and then your microbial species, which amounts to a total of 559. As I said, they're divided into four categories. So what does category 1A mean? That means that national government needs to take immediate steps to combat or eradicate where possible and will fund the clearing of this. Uh, a species that's present on the Bavians River is the yellow flag iris. That's listed as a category 1A. So in theory, if you report this to the green scorpions, they'll send a team out to come and remove that plant. Doesn't always happen, unfortunately. Although we have our department who attends to it. Um, but if it is on national land or on your neighbor's land, in theory, the green scorpions can come and remove that. Category 1B would be listed invasive species. These are required by law to be controlled. This would be your, your Port Jackson willows, your Roy Crances, um, those type of species. The category 2 is your listed invasive species. You are allowed to keep them, but under under strict conditions, you require a permit and you need to ensure that you are controlling your boundaries, that you've got no spillover, so to say, garden escapees. Uh, a plant that fits into that category would be your beef wood, um, you often used as windrows in agricultural purposes, your pine tree, if it's in a plantation. Um, then you've got your category three, which means you're allowed to keep them, but you're not allowed to sell them or 
introduce any more. So that would be your Brazilian peppers, your Manitoka species. But sadly, for the residents along by the Arns River, category three plants, specimens in riparian areas are treated as category one B. So this is our project boundary. As you can see, it runs right from the top of the mountain catchment to the beach. Um, there is a portion that is private property in between that we have no access to, but we would like to work with the landowner and, and gain access in order to control the invasives present in the riparian zone. Species present, according to the number list, out of those 383, we have 36 species present in body arms. So our workload assessment is conducted prior to clearing. You'll see the department is city parks, they own the land, the earth is scafe green belt. Uh, it's 4.7 hectares long, so our, our second follow up, um, and then the scientific species present, as well as the, the category in terms of age class, whether they're seedlings, young, mature. And then, of course, the estimated density cover, as well as the member category. So what you see, plants like English ivy, that's a category three, because it's in a riparian zone, will revert to a 1B. Your Brazilian pepper, because it's in a riparian zone, will revert to a 1B. So it's important to note that our approach is going to, to be to, to, to deal with the smaller uh, category twos and threes, although they are 1B, we are going to look at targeting the seedlings and the saplings first before coming through and removing the, the elder plants. And the team will focus predominantly on the lantanas, your ichiums, the randodonex, your wild gingers, and, and Australian cheesewoods, the longleaf wattles, likes of. Just like to show a few pictures of some of the other work that we've been involved in. Um, I know sometimes it looks like a bomb's gone off after the team's been through, um, but I just like to appeal to give it time and let nature do its thing and let us assist too. So this is a site of Spongemat wetlands in Constantia that was infested with the Rondodonex. Uh, Neighbours on either side of this river hadn't seen each other in 20 years. And our alien invasive team came in and removed the invasive plants. The Green Jobs team dove tailed that and did another follow-up and dug out all the rhizomes from that Arundo Donax and planted it up with indigenous species. 13 species were introduced and that is eight months later. Again, Arundo Donax infestation, this is just from a different angle, cleared it, dug the rhizomes out because we had the time and planted it up with a lot of restios and junker species and gave it time and the water came back and that's a lovely wetland. Again, this is Kirstenhof wetland that was previously infested with Kukui and was being dominated uh, with Typha capensis. The team came in and removed the Kukui and planted it up with indigenous species and again gave it time and you've got a lovely wetland that's full of that's increased its biodiversity value and is now an established lepidote breeding area. I'd like to encourage, encourage all of you to become a spotter. The city of Cape Town has a website called capetowninvasivespecies.org.za. There are ID kits that will help you identify the plants as well as um, a full list of species that we are controlling from the early detection and rapid response site. And I would encourage you to register to become a spotter. You take a picture of the plants or animals, it gets loaded onto our database and gets sent to the relevant project manager and he'll inform you once the team has been present and cleared it. I'd just like to thank you for all your time and I welcome any questions after. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, I think there's 30 of us on this call. Um, we can maybe try and take questions live um, or if anybody prefers to put it in the chat. I just don't want to uh, one for this to go on too long and, and to 
to get caught up with people maybe having bandwidth issues but um if anybody um can you comment in the chat room if you have if you'd like to ask a question and then i'll unmute you yeah sure um and i'm just catching up with the chat unfortunately i couldn't see it while i was doing the presentation i'm more than happy to to um, circulate this presentation as well as our plant me instead our guides, uh, our guideline, which has plant me instead, instead of planting invasive plants, we have a pamphlet that gives the the homeowner an alternative, an indigenous alternative, as well as all of our weed alert uh, posters for, for those who are interested. Okay, so uh, Richard, Robin is asking, uh, can you give any advice on removing ivy? Uh, she's tried with not much luck. So ivy needs to be um, you obviously need to find the root source um, and you'd need to cut it and apply a registered herbicide. Um, I can take it up with Robin privately and I can send her um, the registered herbicide for that. And yeah, where does one purchase, Kiki's asking, where does one purchase the herbicide and blue marker to do one's own eradication? So we, we purchase it from a company called Henchem. Nchem, H-E-N, and then chem. Um, but most, most agricultural places sell herbicide. What I'll also do is circulate the registered herbicide list for the number species, because we aren't allowed to use a herbicide for species unless it's been registered. So it's very important to make sure that the species is, uh, has a registered herbicide before just applying any herbicide to it. Any other questions? Does anybody yes. want to? Yes, I see the West uh, comment there. Um, yes, that specifically speaks to landowners um, with dense stands of, of invasive plants. You cannot go in with a bulldozer and plow your land and, and say that you were clearing. That's not clearing, that's plowing. Um, I believe that we are following a, a cautious approach albeit it does look like a bit of a mess on some parts of the site. Um, but there is a, a species list that we're targeting and we are not just plowing that land. In terms of replanting the, blank, the banks, um, I think that's something that we'd look at in the planting season. For now, the team is stabilizing the banks with some of the invasive brush that they've cut. And I think, um, we'll look at replanting as we go into the winter months. With regards to the big gums in the Bavians there, that is a phase two to remove them. And we all know that they shouldn't be there and they are a fire risk, as well as um, providing a, a huge mother trees, a constant um, seed bank for, for further infestations. And phase two, Richard, is, is what we're anticipating will be early in 2021 in terms of uh, the, the yes. big gums you just referred to, yes. So then with, her with herbicide to, for amphibians, yes. Um, yeah, that's why you have to use registered herbicide and we aren't foliar spraying, we're applying it to a cut stump. So there's very little collateral damage or runoff for that matter. Um, if the team is foliar spraying for whatever matter, please report that immediately and um, they are. They should not be foliar spraying at all. So there'd be very little damage to amphibians and wildlife for that matter, since it is a selective approach. The question about if a large tree I ring barked or poisoned, what happens to the dead wood as far as, far as fire risk goes? Obviously, it is still a fire risk being there, but you'd need to assess it individually, uh, given its proximity to other trees and so on and so forth. Are you doing the RA? Is that the, supposed to be the TAR? Are you doing that, I think, was the question. Uh, the upper part of catchment of the Bavians River falls within sand parks, land if I am correct. Yes. So that would be their mandate. I unfortunately can't 
can't answer that, but you are welcome to report them to the Green Scorpions. They are still liable to, to NEMA and, and NEMBA regulations. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly, um, Ian, I'm not sure exactly which pines you're referring to, but there is a, a cluster of pines as you walk up to the waterfall um, from the top of Barbie Unscliffe Road, there's a, a, a large cluster of pines on the right hand side and um, the CID has budgeted to remove those um, in year two um, of the CID plan. The nasturtiums turning yellow, I'll have to follow up on that. Uh, what's the Cape Town project and what is it subsidized? Um, the, the, we're working closely together. The reality is that with the additional budget that the city of Cape Town has been able to, to bring, we've been able to achieve a great deal more than we would have been able to achieve uh, with the CID. So we'd, we'd spent a great deal of time uh, determining exactly what um, we, we felt we could achieve with the CID budget, really what we were most likely to focus on was the big trees given that they were both invasive species and a fire risk so I think probably what the city of Cape Town's project has, has brought to the party is is being able to remove much more of the um, the shrubbery as well as the trees. Um, and then with regards to that large lantana bush Robert, opposite your house in terms of controlling it yes I wouldn't recommend cutting it out if you had to do a cut cut stamp and apply herbicide herbicide to that the roots will still be present and would die off slowly, which would form a bit of stabilization. Um, I don't recommend cutting it, cutting it up and removing it by roots, certainly. And then how much CT, how much yeah, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think I've answered that one. We, we would like to do does this only apply to the river or to pavements in the area also? It applies to all land that is city owned. So I think what we were looking at is addressing the, the bottom part near the Scouts Hall, if I can remember correctly too, as well as that little play park for the dogs and kids. So the criteria for cutting specific trees. It's often budget related. Um, the older trees will cost a hell of a lot of money and would require a specialized team to come in and do that. Our tender that we have at the moment with a contractor does not make provision for specialized tree felling work. So that would have to go out on a request for quotation. And um, obviously, I think you're looking at around probably between 10 to 15,000 Rand for one of those big trees, uh, including biomass removal. So we'd need to see how far we could get with 200,000 because that would be the cap with the RFQ and then we'd have to um, point out which trees we would like to go within the first round, so to say. So just with regard to the, the comment of um, a huge gum tree on our property border, um, which was cut only to a height of about four to, to five metres, um, I am aware of that. Um, I think there is, I, I don't believe, I'm, I'm fairly sure that that wasn't done by uh, the City of Cape Town's invasive species team, and I, I know it wasn't done by the CID team. So I, I, I believe it may have been City Parks, but I, I need to investigate that further. So I, I am aware of it. I know it needs to be followed up on. Um, and I, I, it, I will do so. I'm just fairly sure it wasn't. I mean, Richard, I, you're, as you've just said, uh, Ashley's team has no mandate to remove large trees, nor do they have the equipment. So it certainly wasn't them. And I know it wasn't us. So we need to establish who actually did that. And if you're not satisfied with the answer, unfortunately, it is what it is, Ur West. So the team is clearing. We're not plowing, we're not digging out everything. There will be a little bit of collateral damage, like I explained in the beginning. Not collateral damage, but there will, it will look like a, a building site, so to say. It's appealed to, to give it some and let nature do its thing, as well as introduce the correct species that were there. Um, it is city land that we're working on. 
We aren't working on private property, so we have the right to control it within the means and manner that we are. Uh, will the big trees be replaced by anything? Um, Richard, obviously that's a project for next year. And I presume obviously when you do come along to remove trees, again, one takes into account the potential erosion, et cetera, and uh, ensures that uh, the, the appropriate, uh, what's the right word, uh, sort of uh, support is left in place. Yes, correct. Look, it's city parks land, they're responsible for it. We have the tender to control invasive species. So, we don't have the mandate, so to say, to come in and to plant trees up there, although we have done it in the past under the Working for Wetlands banner. Um, however, we can work very closely with city parks and Keith Hartnick and Bart, I think is the, the new um, area manager for Hart Bay. And we can provide the labor. And if they can provide the trees, we, we're certainly happy to plant, to, to plant some trees into that green belt. What we can offer is, uh, riparian plants such as your cypress textilis, your juncus effusus, and orpheums and wachendorfias, stuff like that. With regards to Daza River, yes, quotes have been received this week and approved. Clearing should commence in December. We'll start in Daza 01 and work our way down to Daza 07. A reveg intervention will also be done in Daza 05 together with Jackie Wales. I think she's in another uh, friends group within Heart Bay. Yeah, I think she's actually on this call as well. Okay. Then how will ongoing maintenance be done? So we have budget to come in other every six months with a big contractor team and um, to do a follow-up or alternatively we can look for budget from other departments again the way the city works is rather confusing for a simple for a resident to understand the mandate for the river is stormwater the minute it goes onto the riparian bank it's city parks so where we come in is we like to call ourselves the chameleons and we'll work on any part of city land as long as it's got invasive species present on it. So in terms of us coming to get more budget, or in terms of our maintenance plan, it would be six, six months, but the idea would be to have a constant presence with these wardens that would be funded by either city parks, environmental management department or stormwater. I think let's keep Daza for another meeting if we can um, and focus specifically on Bavians for this. I'm happy to set up another meeting for Daza to take you through our clearing operations for that too. Yes, I can circulate a map. And the list of plants, trees that fall into the approved category for replanting, I'm, I'm sure that's something we could circulate. Yes, uh, the plant means that. Um, yes, uh, what's this, can you please agree that the dumping ground in terms of, is that for garden refuge? Yes, what we see is a lot of garden escapees and also a lot of residents just dumping their garden refuge over into the green belt, especially when a team is clearing. It's amazing how the pile grows overnight. Um, so I appeal to, to all just sort your own garden refuge out, and we all do our utmost to keep ours clean too. Um, are the tree ferns which were removed invasive? Tree ferns are listed in member for the New Zealand tree fern. Um, are, would have to come and see the team removing that. Um, I wasn't aware that they weren't supposed to take out tree ferns. That wasn't on the on our list, as you've seen. So I'll have to come and investigate that. Yes, it, do, it does also somewhat depend where they were because I, I'm, it shouldn't have been removed. But we've obviously, what we've been doing from the CID perspective is trying to improve access to the river. So some of the, the access points, for example, at the top of Scape Street um, from Coral Close, 
um, we've we've done some some cutting back to make the the, the area more um, you know, easily accessible to those who want to go and walk along the river bank. But that wouldn't involve any removal. But it might have involved some um, some trimming. And I think um, in areas where where residents are concerned that it may become a dumping hotspot, we can always look at um, reintroducing indigenous plants there too, and creating little biodiversity nodes or hotspots, so, so to say, that will hopefully, hopefully deter dumping as a, as a suggestion. Am I not worried about security making it accessible? Um, no, because to be honest, it, it was always, it was already accessible. And unfortunately for those who perhaps have less uh, commendable motivations for walking along the riverbank, they, they, they they can make their way through whatever, regardless of how impassable it might be. But it's, um, you know, we're very fortunate to have the river corridor. Um, we're very fortunate to have the river corridor within our area. And um, we feel that it's, we know that people enjoy walking along it and we want to make it more easily accessible to those who do. In terms of security, um, that's that's where the, um, the public safety aspect of the CID comes in. Um, we're installing um, cameras at the very top of the river, at the top of Bobby Arnscliff um, Road in the river bed there, and also tracking up into the mountainside. And as once the trees are removed next year, then we'll um, be able to install a few more cameras potentially along the river corridor, because cam cameras are only useful if they can actually have some kind of line of sight. So the river is in our area, we, we have to accept that. And regardless of whether it's, it's clear or not clear, it's always going to be somewhat of a, of, a, of an access route. So um, we want to make it an area that we can enjoy and then use public safety to try and ensure that it's not used for, uh, for ulterior motives. And just on top of that, Helen, it's, it's not as though we just want to, we've got to be in our bonnet, so to say, and we've woken up and now we want to clear invasive species. There is clear legislation that enforces the city of Cape Town to control invasive species on their land. The river, large parts of it, is city of Cape Town land, and we have no option but to clear invasive plants on it. We will try and do it as thorough and as least damaging to the natural environment as possible, but ultimately the invasive species present, they are more damaging to the environment than the clearing operations. I think it's very important for the residents to note that. Um, improving access, high human foot traffic, what will be done to manage the potential? Um, you know, un un unfortunately, we, uh, people behaving badly and, and not respecting the environment is, is, is a fact of life. Um, it's going to be something that's difficult to control but I, I do think when it comes to dog poop um, I feel in general we have a sh shortage of, of bins and, and areas to uh, the means to dispose of it so I've seen I know a couple of people have taken it upon themselves to put in place initiatives to provide um, bags that people can use um, and I think that's a great initiative and that's something we could look at at sort of the entry and exit points to the river um, I'm also um, trying to source a significant number more, uh, more rubbish bins for the park at the bottom of Andrews Road because I think there's, there's nowhere near enough there. And if there's a need to put some at the points where we access the river, that's something that we can investigate as well. Um, concerned about a very large pine besides others adjacent to our complex. Um, can we have an insurance that this will be removed? Uh, Obviously, that we would have to know exactly whose land it was on, as to if it does sit on uh, municipality land or sorry along the river corridor. Then I would assume that that would form part of phase two in uh, in the next year. Yes, if you can, if if um, I don't know who the gentleman is who sent that, but if they can send me an email um, directly to my email address, and I can take it up with other. That could either be a, a widow maker tree if it's if it has the ability to cause damage to a property, then they might treat it differently from a, a road reserve point of view. Um, so if they can just send me the details and I'll have a look on city map here to determine who owns that land and then take it up with the landowner. Yeah, it is apparently municipality land, according okay. to the person who posed the question. Um, I'm just trying to see whether was any questions that we've missed? Uh, did we answer this? Is it allowed, encouraged for residents to remove smaller invasive species if they're clearly identified? I 
Um, well, there's a partnership between Hot Bay Sid and the city of Cape Town, Helen. So I think if there is supervision and Jemima is happy to to provide that, I, say, I see no reason why they, the residents cannot help. Okay, thanks. No, it's not going to look like an urban park. Um, I don't know if some of the residents have walked in the Constantia Valley Greenbelts where there's still pockets of indigenous rainbows and and forests. That's the idea over the next few years. It's not to turn it into a, a mowed lawn, so to say, manicured lawns, no. And again, we have to we have to follow the the regulations and the the, the species that are listed in there. If if we can see a species is highly invasive, like some of those Sizigiums, for example, the Sizigium cordatum is indigenous, but we know it's invasive in riparian zones. It's it's not. It's an indigenous species to South Africa, but it's invasive in riparian zones within the Western Cape. Um, so what we'll do is we'll look at targeting the smaller species, but we won't take out the big trees. We don't have a mandate to take out those big trees unless we are coming to replant an indigenous species. Again, the bamboo is very invasive, but I, I, and you see the dwarf bamboo listed in the NIMBA regulations. Um, and Kiki, to answer your question, if you do some of your own cleaning, clearing, can you place the refuse outside for clearing? That's something we can we can definitely look into. I would just ask that you liaise with us so that we can ensure that it's it's picked up um, uh, swiftly and, and not left there and uh, able to spread and we just make arrangements. But obviously we do have an appointed contractor looking after our public open spaces and regularly taking away bucky loads um, uh, of, uh, of cleared biomass. So as long as you liaise with us, yes, and, and it's not obviously, well, it, we can't be doing huge amounts of it, but there's definitely scope to help out, yes. Um, so I can come in there. Um, fortunately, we have a biocontrol agent for the prickly pear, if it's a Puntia manicantha species, um, which would require us to just come and give you an agent, it's cochineal. It's a little white fungus that grows on the plant and it smothers it over time. Um, that's the most effective way to control it. Uh, obviously, when you cut bamboo, you'd have to bag, I mean, not bamboo, so if you cut your prickly pear, you'd have to bag it and then send it to a, a landfill site or incinerate it. Um, and each piece has the ability to create a small plant. So if you can get in contact with me or if I can get your contact details via Jemima and I'll make um, some cochineal available um, to be dropped off at your property and that will target your your um, bunny ears or your prickly pear. So just in case anybody on this call isn't familiar with Jemima, um, Jemima Birch who, who lives on, on Scape Street is and has, has done so for many many years um, she was also uh, very instrumental to the steering committee of the, of the CID to help us map out the, the plan for the environmental and, and urban management and improvement and she really is extremely knowledgeable and while I'm sure many of you after this call are going to be very keen to chat to Richard directly I, I, I think what we're also what we're hoping to achieve over the medium term is that Jemima becomes the, um, the, the local point person for everyone to go to for some advice and as and when she needs it she can refer to Richard um, and I hope she's not going to mind me saying this right now but um, as you all hopefully again are aware, Tuesday evening, we will have our next um, important step in the CID, which is the members meeting where directors will be elected formally to the board. And um, I'm delighted that Jemima um, has accepted uh, to uh, to stand for the board. And I think she's gonna be an incredibly valuable addition um, and particularly given her, her knowledge and experience in this area. So once she uh, is hopefully elected to the board, she then becomes really empowered to take the, the CID budget and, um, uh, and, and apply it to, to all of these uh, these very uh, important uh, aims that we're trying to achieve. Jemima, don't don't kill me for saying that because I didn't tell you I was going to. All right. 
Thanks, Scott. I see your comment there. Appreciate that. Again, we don't want to just obliterate the site, so we'll do it in a phased approach and treat the smaller species. And like I said, maybe we can speak to our colleagues in city parks. I know they have a surplus of trees at the Newlands Nursery. If we can find something suitable, we'll be more than happy to, to plant it. Any more burning questions? Thanks. I see the English RVs are off on the west side of the stream. They will attend to it. That's sorry, Penny. I did see your what about having regular community weeds hack groups? I think, yeah, that's a good idea. I support that with Ian. And the city can always provide tools and equipment as well as the, the registered herbicide for the species present. We can also come and do a workload assessment before that weekend to identify the plants that need to be to be cut. It would be nice if residents who haven't been out and don't know what invasive plants look like, they could always join, um, which would help them obviously clearing on the weekend too. Yes, Tacoma can be very invasive and also needs to be removed. Um, again, that's an indigenous species that is invasive in the Western Cape. So we'll look at attending to the smaller, smaller um, pockets for now and slowly starting start reducing the, the larger stands. U West, with regards to soil erosion, the team will use a lot of the biomass that they've generated from clearing to shore up the banks and Again, a few plants will also be installed just before the winter months and hopefully their, their roots will take. But unfortunately, the, when, when clearing happens, there is a, an element of, of damage that does occur. It just needs to be, to be um, done in a suitable or sustainable manner. So um, like I said, you will sometimes see an exposed piece, piece of earth and, and obviously that doesn't look nice if you've seen a green bush there your whole life. But knowing that that was an invasive bush and it's gone now should also give you peace of mind Then you should rather look forward to see what will be there in the future as opposed to harp on the past. So Bob and Creeper, what's the scientific name? Yes, Sour Fig is also a great bank retainer. So is Cypress Textilis. As well as your Carex, your grasses, Buffalo grass, those type of plants. Fever tree is listed in the NIMBA regulations, if I remember correctly. I don't see any too many, okay. Um, Yes, that's a good point. Um, if you can, if the residents can report any pumps that go into the river, then we can look into the title deeds to see if they have historic water rights. Unfortunately, in the past, they, they gave people a property right into the middle of the river, which has caused some issues going forward. Um, and with that came historical water rights. But we have we have reported landowners in Constantia that were illegally abstracting, as well as landowners who were illegally building, um, obviously being 
in close prox proximity to a water clause, you also trigger NEMO regulations, which would be listed activities. I'm going to ask if, if anybody has any, any more questions they want to ask, they please post them now. I think we're very, very grateful to Richard for his time this evening. Um, and uh, don't want to take up too much of it, although um, I know you have kindly also agreed, Richard, if anybody's interested, we can agree a further date when we could organise a walk along the river. Um, yeah. And that, 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 that's something that we'll, we'll if, if people are interested, if they could please let us know and then we'll, we'll schedule something that's as convenient for as many as, as possible. We'll, we'll take a last few questions. How is the area demarcated from residential property? I mean, there's obviously no physical boundary. Not many of the property owners have walls on the riverbank. Um, so it's quite tricky for the team to to identify what's what's private land and, and, and what's city land. We have issued them with maps, um, but obviously it's not in such high, high detail. So they are, you can sort of see when it becomes a private person's property if they don't have the fence there where they are maintaining their garden. And then I've just asked Ashley to liaise with Jemima who could then liaise with the the homeowner either to allow us access through or to control the invasive plants present on in the riparian zone. And of course, rivers meander throughout town. So I'm not quite sure how that worked um, because Back in the day, they'd give it to you to the middle of the river, but rivers move. So I think if we had to look at an aerial image of the Babians over 100 years, we'd find it's moved a bit. Uh, yes, I imagine if, if obviously, if, do, do you want to just talk a little bit, Richard, about the situation with privately owned land? Uh, yes, um, we have, well, when I say we, South Africa has the Department of Environmental Affairs, who has the Green Scorpions, and their role is to enforce the NIMBA legislation on private landowners, as well as government institutions. So you can report your landowner to a hotline, which is operated by Deloitte. So I'm not sure if they're still operating it. It's, it was efficient the last time I gave it a call. Um, and you'll basically get a reference number. And then it's up to the green scorpions to get in contact with the homeowner and to notify them that they have invasive species present on their property and to inform them to, to control it. And Obviously, if, if they, they don't control it, it could end up in a, a legal court case, which could go on for years. But the idea, obviously, is to, to inform them and to guide them first before following the legal route. I know the city of Cape Town comes and removes EDRR species from private properties. Um, obviously, that is with the, the overall hope to reduce the infestation before that specific plant becomes established. That's how we can justify those costs. So yes, it's your duty of care to control invasive species on your property. And if you don't know, if you've got, if you don't know what plants you've got, have a look at environment.co.za. I can share that link after this meeting. And that gives you a nice list of the, the member plants, as well as photographs attached to them. Alternatively, you can join um, our spotter network on Cape Town Invasive Species.co.za or our naturalist, and you can, our naturalist 
org, I think, and you can load your pictures onto that. And th that's basically a citizen science website where, where people can identify plants for you. And yes, Penny, they should be responsible and absorb the cost to control it. Um, but given that it's on a riparian zone and the boundaries may be blurred, sometimes the landowner will score if they are willing to allow the team to come through. So this is a message from Charmaine, just to say thank you for this meeting. A lot explained. Um, I, I, Richard, it's been, it, for me, it certainly has been incredibly informative. I think it's um, extremely um, useful for people to, to hear it firsthand from you. Um, we're very, very grateful for your time. Um, we'd love you to share the slides, please. I'd like, if it's okay with you, I'd like to post them on our website, um, along with the various links to, to the useful web, other websites that you've mentioned. Um, and uh, obviously we, we do have Jemima here uh, and Jackie who are, and Guy, obviously numerous people who are very, very well versed in this topic. So we've got a lot of uh, experience that we can rely on, but we know that we can come to you with any further questions if we need it. So um, just thank you very much indeed for giving us this time and um, we'll, we'll schedule a walk along the river for those who are interested. A pleasure, yeah, thanks. And thank you for the interest that the residents are showing. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting them along the riverbanks. Right, great. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to bring this meeting to a close then. Thank you very much, everybody.